Imagine you discovered a stone with ancient words carved into it, and they told a really good knock-knock joke. What an archaeological find! But to your surprise, scientists concluded that it came about through purely natural processes. Just physics and chemistry acting on an exposed rock. What? You'd need very specific lines and shapes to form letters, and then those letters would need to be in a very specific arrangement to even get a bad knock-knock joke. Well, if you leave rocks out in the wind and rain for long enough, you're bound to get knock-knock jokes eventually. <laughs> Nobody would buy that, but this is eerily similar to the typical explanations for the origin of life. Except life is no joke, pun intended, and there are many more layers of complexity that would have to come together in order to kickstart life. To get life started, we need to produce the right building blocks in high concentrations and purity, combine them in the right way in spite of the nearly infinite set of unwanted molecules that natural processes are known to produce, collect them inside of a membrane to keep all the good stuff in and the bad stuff out, maintain homeostasis, harness energy from a constant and controlled source, and bring all of this together faster then all the individual parts would expire. Even if you could do all of this, you can't. You still wouldn't be anywhere close to starting life because life requires at least one more all important and very difficult ingredient. Information. Paul Davies and Sarah Walker, professors of theoretical physics at Arizona State University said, although it is notoriously hard to identify precisely what makes life so distinctive and remarkable? There is general agreement that its informational aspect is one key property and perhaps the key property. But what is information and where did it come from? Let's get into it. Where did information come from? That's easy, nature can make information. Well, that's true, sort of. Nature can make certain kinds of information. For example, nature can make illusory information. When we see shapes in the clouds or a face in the waves, it's not really there, it's an illusion. And actually being created by our own imagination. That's not really a taco in the sky. Nature can generate repetitive or deterministic information. Think salt crystals or snowflakes or sedimentary layers. These structures are beautiful, but completely determined by physics. Those shapes have to be that way. Physics demands it. Nature can also produce indiscriminate or non-specific information. Think white noise, or a waterfall, or wind rushing through a canyon. If we came across those kinds of information, we would easily be able to explain it away as natural. We wouldn't need to look for any other explanation. On the other hand, we all know that nature cannot make a knock-knock joke or a speech like the Gettysburg Address. Those things are not illusory, they really exist. They're not merely repetitive patterns, there isn't any physical law that says this word must go after that word, and there were far more words that could have been included but weren't. And it does a thing, makes you laugh or informs you. This kind of information, specific arrangements of independent parts in a complex way, we intuitively know is beyond nature's capability to produce. In other words, if you found the Gettysburg Address in the forest, even if you knew nothing about how it got there or who wrote it, you would know there was an author. Here's the all-important question. Is DNA more similar to salt crystals and white noise? or to the Gettysburg Address. Scientists have known for years that DNA is an informational code that is used to manufacture proteins, the tiny machinery of life. But we keep learning how DNA contains far more information than just protein coding. DNA also regulates or controls what proteins are made and when. Now, this may sound easy or boring, but it's really important. Imagine you're a little E. coli bug. You're getting a little peckish and you want a snack. Your favorite food? Sugar, of course. Now, there's two different kinds of sugar you could eat, but everybody knows that glucose is a way tastier sugar than lactose. Eating these two different kinds of sugars requires two different kinds of machinery. 
Sort of like eating soups requires bowls and spoons and spaghetti requires plates and forks. If it's soup day, you don't want to waste energy making plates and forks. That's a dumb, dumb move. You're a smart little bug. Wasting energy makes you less fit, so you know to turn off fork production when you don't need it. This is regulation. Without this, all your precious energy would be spent making forks and spoons and spatulas and ice cube trays, and then you die. So, in the DNA, we have a library of blueprints for all the different tools we can build. But we can't build them all willy-nilly or we'll die. So also within DNA is information to build regulatory proteins as well as little docking stations for them to hook onto DNA. Normally, when glucose is available, no forks or plates are made. It's soupville. But if there's only lactose, the lactose is sensed by a regulatory protein, causing it to detach from DNA, unblocking the code to build lactose machinery, plates and forks. The glucose sensor is the opposite. When it doesn't sense glucose, it binds to a different part of the DNA to advertise, hey, let's build some lactose machinery over here. So regulation of protein construction is another required layer of information in order to get life started. But wait, there's more. Those regulatory proteins also have regulatory regions of their own. Additional code in the DNA to control their production. DNA has code to regulate the regulatory process and can even have code to regulate the regulator regulators. Multiple layers of coding complexity. When building proteins, of course there's code for which bits of the protein to assemble next, but there's also instructions on how quickly or slowly the next amino acid is mushed on there, which controls protein folding. If a newly formed protein isn't properly folded, it could be a complete waste, or worse yet, it could be toxic and kill you. And there's even more than that. Sometimes a string of DNA can carry one message when read forward, and a completely different one when it's read backwards. Like if Lincoln read the Gettysburg Address backwards, it was instructions on what he wanted for lunch. If you've ever tried to make a palindrome, it's like that, but way harder. The same string of DNA that codes for a protein can also contain embedded instructions on when to build it. Like if the first letter in every third word of Lincoln's speech also spelled out instructions on when and where he should deliver the speech. Plus, DNA isn't read one character at a time. It's read through a window, three characters at once. And if we shift that window over one or two spaces, we can sometimes get a completely different functional message. Imagine if the Gettysburg Address had another secret message in it. If you just moved the spaces over by two, four score and seven years ago would become fo usco rednius in resco. Huh. What if we just move them over by one? Wait, what? There is a new message. Long story short is the best and you should totally subscribe. Wow, thanks Abraham Lincoln. Total bro that guy thinking about us 160 years ago. Obviously, DNA is packed with information, and even that word information does it a disservice. What if someone says, we're talking about the origin of the first life here, not complex life. Life started out very simply. Information slowly accumulated over millions of years through chemical evolution, replication, random errors, and filtering by natural selection, just like this paper says. Well. There's five problems with that. Information can't accumulate because chemical evolution can't even get started. Molecules that store information don't naturally self-replicate. There are many well understood properties of chemistry and physics that tell us a self-replicating biopolymer could not form naturally. And if it can't replicate, it can't accumulate. Any hypothetical self-replication process would need significant information to even begin. Number two, self-replication requires high accuracy in order to accumulate, like 99.9% .9 accuracy. Lab experiments can't get anywhere near this. Number three, things are constantly expiring. Just like you can't slowly store up a pool full of milk over a long period of time, having more time actually hurts because milk expires. You've got to do it in less time. This can't be emphasized enough. Time is not the friend to abiogenesis. Time is the enemy. And for the next two reasons, we need to know that the information that's required for life goes far, far deeper than a straightforward string of letters. There are multiple additional layers of informational complexity that are unique to the information in life, even in the simplest forms of life. 
Reason number four, that the information can't accumulate over long periods of time. The information in life actually changes the same material that holds the information. Paul Davies and Sarah Walker said this, Biological systems are distinctive because information manipulates the matter it is instantiated in. Okay, imagine if the words of the Gettysburg Address, when written as ink on paper, caused the paper to fold up and origami itself into a three-dimensional shape that looked like Abraham Lincoln. Amazingly, the information of life is like that. For example, the information inside of some RNA molecules can detect if that RNA is needed, and if not, it will chop itself into pieces. Oh! DNA contains self-referential information. It can sense it has, say, two of this gene, and then decide, hmm, let's have a hundred. It can modify the number of genes stored within itself. This is wild. And number five, this information can't accumulate because the information of life is not just centralized in DNA. It sounds crazy, but it's also kind of obvious. DNA can't do anything on its own. It can't even replicate on its own. It'll just sit there. The information needed for life is scattered across various parts of the cell that are completely dependent on each other to survive. This creates so many chicken and egg paradoxes, it's not even funny. DNA can't do anything without RNA and proteins. Proteins can't exist without DNA and RNA. RNA comes from DNA via the help of proteins. You need them all at once. Paul Davies and Sarah Walker again. The manner in which information flows through and between cells and subcellular structures is quite unlike anything else observed in nature. For example, DNA doesn't contain the information to construct a cell membrane, only to add to it. The information that started the first cell membrane has instead been passed on from generation to generation, membrane to membrane, circumventing DNA. The cooperation between sources of information and life is inherited, passed down from generation to generation. All of the different connections needed between these things, they're not held within DNA itself. It just exists already and is passed down. Not to mention there's many other codes of life, not just DNA. More on that in a later video. So is the information in DNA in the nature could have done it camp or the nah camp? Unguided natural processes can't produce jokes or speeches. They are beyond nature's capability. It isn't even a question. If you see something like the Gettysburg Address, you immediately know someone produced it. Even if we never saw the author, even if we know nothing about them, an author must exist. The information needed for even the very simplest life is not merely like a knock-knock joke or a speech. It far surpasses it. In many areas of science, investigators have to decide if natural processes or an intelligent mind is the best explanation for their observations. Archaeologists look at buried artifacts to determine if they were made by natural processes or a creative mind. Are these arrowheads or just rocks? Coroners investigate deaths to determine if they were caused by a natural process, like old age, or by the will of a human mind, homicide. SETI looks for signs of intelligence in outer space. These scientists must remain unbiased when deciding between natural processes and intelligent causes. But somehow, when it comes to the origin of life, scientists can only consider purely natural explanations. Thinking otherwise is strictly prohibited. Wouldn't it be better if we were allowed to follow the evidence in science wherever it leads? rather than being forced to follow the presuppositions and preferences of the scientists. Thanks for watching.